There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. right into the Word of God tonight, shall we? Would you open your Bible with me to the Gospel according to Mark? And if you say, oh, he's changing subjects. No, I'm not changing subjects, just changing Gospel records. We began all day yesterday in Matthew chapter number 21. And when you come to Mark chapter number 11, you come to the parallel to Matthew chapter number 21. Now, you'll remember that each of these Gospel writers, remember one Gospel, four Gospel writers, each of these Gospel writers under inspiration of the Holy Spirit gives us a different perspective on the same Christ and the same events. And the Holy Spirit gives us different details that really complement all the parts, make the whole, like a jigsaw puzzle, you put it all together. I must tell you that I, I'm enjoying this week, for me, for me, walking the steps with Jesus of the last year, or the last week, rather, of his life. If you had to boil his whole life down and say, what is the most important week, I'd say it's this week. As a matter of fact, it wasn't just the most important week of Christ's life. It is the most important week in the history of the world because if Jesus hadn't done what he did this week, you and I'd be lost. So between the triumphal entry of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, now that's what we're concentrating on. And there's no way, let's just get this out of the way right up front. There's no way we can cover all that this week in the handful of meetings that we have, but I'm I'm trying to at least get you started down the path. Come on, take a walk with me. Would you take a walk with me? And we're walking in the footsteps of Jesus. And I hope you'll just keep walking all week long, leading right up to Resurrection Sunday through these closing chapters of the four gospel records. And to see all that the Lord said and did. Because I'm telling you, it is profound. It's powerful in every way. Now let's review for just a moment. Because early on the Lord's day, we began where our Lord began by sending for a donkey. Do you remember the little colt he was going to ride into? The Lord hath need of him. And we learned something about the spirit of submission, yielding to the Lord. And then we followed him through the gates into the city of Jerusalem as he rode in on that colt. And the multitude shouted one word. Anybody remember the word they shouted? Hosanna. That's the word. Hosanna. Which means, do you remember what it means? Save now. Very good. And that is a word I think we ought to incorporate ourselves and we ought to be praying for those who need the Lord. Dear Lord, save now. The Lord's salvation is always a present tense salvation. Aren't you glad the same God who saved in the past still saves today? And may the Lord save now. And then last evening, we really crossed the divide from Sunday into Monday, whether you realized it or not. And I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. Because the Lord actually cleansed the temple on Monday. He went into the temple on Sunday. I'll show you that. But the actual cleansing of the temple happened the following day on Monday, and that would set in motion a chain of events that really hastens toward the cross. Do you remember all through the three and a half year ministry of Jesus, he kept saying something like this, my hour is not yet come. Do you remember that? My time is not yet come. But then there was a moment, a turning point, when the Bible says he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. That was the moment it all changed. That was the moment where the time had come, and now... It is moving rapidly towards the cross. Now look with me in Mark chapter number 11. In verses 1 through 10, you find this triumphal entry. This is Sunday. And the Bible says on Sunday evening, look at verse 11, And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. This is the end of the triumphal entry Sunday. So he does go into the temple on that day. He doesn't immediately drive them out. Watch this, please. Have you, ever, have you ever just walked around your house and made an inspection of things that need to be straightened out? 
Have you ever just taken inventory and made a checklist and said, we got to fix that? How many husbands know what a honeydew list is? Yes. So we all understand there are things that need to be cared for. There's always things that need to be cared for. Could I remind you, Jesus was walking through his own house when he came into the temple. Remember, it is the temple of God. And who is Jesus? He's the son of God. So the son is coming to inspect the father's house. He sees it all. Use a little imagination. He looks around. He just kind of nods at it. And then he turns around, goes back to Bethany where he was staying. And then when you come to verse number 12, it says, And on the morrow. Would you mark that expression in your Bible, on the morrow? You might even want to write in the margin of your Bible, this is Monday morning now. This is Monday. And it's interesting to me to see how the Lord fits all these things together. And I bring you to Mark's record because Mark really shows us a little more of the chronology of it where Matthew just immediately runs into the, into the temple cleansing. Mark shows us the chronology of it. And on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. We all can identify with that. How many of you are hungry right now? Would you raise your hand? Some of you are already thinking, praying about what you're going to eat when the preacher finishes preaching tonight. Jesus was hungry. And the Bible says, And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. This is very significant. I just did a study recently in our daily broadcast on all the miracles of Jesus. This is one of, if not the only, miracle of Jesus that was destructive in nature. He's always healing, raising the dead, right? He's fixing things. Here, he curses something, causes it to wither up. I would say to you, it's still constructive in nature because he did it for a purpose and he did it to teach the disciples a great truth. We'll see that in just a moment. But notice, please, it's breakfast time. He wants some figs, and he finds nothing on it. I love this. You see in these verses the humanity and the deity of Christ. Would you, would you mark in verse 12, he's hungry. That's his humanity. And in verse number 14, he looks at the fig tree and says, you're never going to bear fruit again. Look what well, that is. That's the deity of Christ. Only the creator can stop the creation from doing what he created for it to do. And so you've got all man and all God. Was he all man? Oh, yes. But was he all God? Oh, yes. He's all God. He's not 50-50. He's 100-100, and he's the perfection of both. So this is Monday. Now, look carefully, would you please? This is significant. Beginning in verse number 15, they come into Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. That's what we studied last night. Everybody remember that? Let me show you how it fits in and why it's sandwiched in here between this discussion about the fig tree. The fig tree was symbolic of something. And this is really not my message, but let me just throw this in for good measure so you understand. The fig tree was symbolic of the nation of Israel and the Jewish people at this time, excuse me, that had a whole lot of show and had no substance. In fact, that fig tree represented exactly what he had seen the night before in the temple and exactly what he was getting ready to judge in the Father's house because, look, please, those people had learned, are you ready for this, how to try to be good without God. And I say to you, there's no way to be good without God. There's none that doeth good. But they had learned all the form without any of the fruit. May I use the words of Scripture? Nothing but leaves. Nothing but leaves. My mind immediately now is going back to Adam and Eve in the garden. You remember them? What did they try to use to cover their nakedness? They sewed what? Fig leaves together. Nothing, nothing but leaves. And God says, that'll never do. That will never do, my friend. Listen to me. Your fig leaf, your, your good effort, your church going, your baptism, your, your good works, your trying hard will never be good enough. God says he wants genuine fruit. And that only he can produce. And so he curses the fig tree. Now come over with me to verse number 20 and we come to our text. And in the morning. Would you mark that expression? In the morning. How would you mark in verse 12? On the morrow. And in verse 20, in the morning. Would you write in the margin of your Bible next to verse 20? This is Tuesday morning now. So we're, we're connecting Monday and Tuesday because on Monday he curses a fig tree and on Tuesday he teaches you why. Look please. Verse 20, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, I wish, I wish I could say this like Peter said it, Master, 
Behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. How many of you have ever been shocked to actually see God do something? Be honest. Isn't it amazing how we have such little expectations from such a mighty God and then we get almost surprised when the Lord actually shows up? And Peter said, I heard you say that yesterday, but I mean, look at it. It's already dead. Overnight, it just, boom, withered up and died. And I love the fact, when you come to verse 22, Jesus says nothing about the fig tree. Do you know why? Because it wasn't about the fig tree. May I tell you, the Lord has an easy time getting the rest of creation to understand him. It's the humans he has difficulty with. And the Lord wasn't trying to get through to the fig tree. The Lord was trying to get through to Peter and the rest of the disciples. Nay, the Lord's trying to get through to me and you. And so the Lord says, Jesus answering, saith unto them. Would you read the next four words with me, church? Have faith in God. Mm. That's powerful. That's powerful. Peter's staring at a fig tree that's withered from the roots. His mouth is open. Look at this, Lord. I can't believe this. And Jesus says, look at God. Mm. And I tell you what the great need right now is. The great need in our world full of cursing, full of destruction, full of barrenness, full of withering is for us to get our eyes off of that and back on our great God. Let me tell you what faith is. Faith is looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Faith is lifting up your head and fixing your gaze purposely on the greatness and glory of our mighty God. And Jesus said, Peter, have faith in God. May I tell you what the answer to the barren life is? Faith in God. <laughs> May I tell you what the answer to the fruitless life is? Faith in God. May I tell you what the answer to destruction and cursing is? Faith in God. Look, please. The antithesis and the antidote is faith in God. It is the Godward life. And then he continues, look at verse 23, For verily I say unto you, I love that word, verily. It's the word, amen. Amen, truly. Pay attention to this. Verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when you pray. Would you mark that phrase in verse 24? When you pray. What's it say, church? When ye pray. It doesn't say if you pray. He presupposes the followers of Christ actually would pray. When ye pray. Anybody remember what he just said when he was in the temple driving out the money changers? He said, get all this junk out of here. My father's house is to be a house of what? prayer look please we're to be a people of prayer and so do you see the connection here look it's not chopped up it's all connected Jesus just cast a bunch of stuff out of the temple as an illustration now he uses the fig tree as an illustration now he brings them to the great truth he said it's time for you to start living by faith and living the prayer life and he says when you pray believe that you receive them and you shall have them and when you stand praying forgive if you have ought against any that your father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. I want you to take your pen tonight and mark something in your Bible. I'd like you to mark this expression in verse 23. Say unto this mountain, Be thou removed. And for a few moments, I want to talk to you about moving mountains. Moving mountains. The reality is, all through scripture, all through history, mountains are the one thing that have been viewed as the immovable object. You either got to tunnel through them, you got to go around them, you got to go over top of them, but you're not going to move the mountain. It is the immovable object. The Lord uses a little hyperbole here. It's really a beautiful thing. Jesus didn't go around literally taking mountains and casting them into the sea. But he did move mountains, and I'll show you that in just a moment. And he made a way that we could see the mountains move too. I live in southern West Virginia, and very often I fly out of Charleston, West Virginia. And the airport there, Yeager Airport, named after Chuck Yeager, who broke the sound barrier and uh, was from that area, uh, is a fascinating airport. If you've ever flown in or out of there, people get a little nervous when they fly in out for the first time because you're, you're just up in the air, you don't see anything, and then boom, you touch down on top of a mountain. 
And when you take off, you taxi, and you, you take off down the runway, and when you get to the end of the runway, everything just disappears beneath you. You better hope it gets off the ground. Do you understand what I mean? Because it just takes off. West Virginia is the only state in America that every square inch of the state is in a mountain range. And so you live in beautiful mountains here. Every inch of our state is in the Appalachian Mountain Range. So there is no flat land. It's, it's all rolling hills and mountains. And so they said, we've got to have an airport, but we don't know where to put an airport. And there was a man named L.G. Letourneau. Have you ever heard that name? L.G. Letourneau was a Christian businessman. Dr. Lee Robertson used to talk a great deal about uh, R.G. Letourneau. He was quite an inventor, and he was quite a Christian. He was a man of faith in God. R.G. Letourneau was, was used to invent some mountain-moving equipment that was unlike anything that had ever been seen. And they brought that equipment in, and they literally took the top off that mountain. If you look at it from the sky, it is literally a, an airstrip on the top of a mountain. It's just as flat as it can possibly be. They just took a portion of it off. They moved the mountain. In my library at home, I have a biography that was given to me about a man who lived in the Blue Ridge Mountains by the name of Bob Childress. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not. Bob Childress, his biography is called The Man Who Moved a Mountain. And he was quite a sinner, let me tell you. He was a rough mountain man. He was rough around the edges and crude in every way and a rebel against God. And then God gloriously saved him. And when God saves people, God changes people. And Bob Childress became a new creature in Jesus Christ. And you know what he did? He started winning those mountain people to the Lord there in that portion of Virginia. And Bob Childress was used literally to turn that whole region to the Lord and see hundreds and hundreds of people saved. God was moving mountains in his life. The expression has been used for lots of people through the years, but let me just say this tonight. There's only one person who can move the mountains, and that is our great God. That's the one who formed the mountains. So when the Lord brings us to this portion of Scripture and talks about saying to a mountain, Be thou removed, don't, don't think this is some name it and claim it kind of religion where you just slot machine it and say what you want to say. If you say it, it's going to happen. No, no, remember, have faith in who? God. So it is a Godward view of life. It is a Godward view of prayer. It is a Godward view of circumstances. The Lord is teaching us how to enter in to what God wants and see the mighty power of God at work. I bring you to this portion of Scripture tonight, if I may be very personal for just a moment, because right now I have a mountain that needs to be moved. I don't think it serves a purpose for you to, me to tell you what it is. It was something very dear, someone very dear to me and something very personal and something that has been just weighing on me. How many of you ever have burdens? You know, you're not going to get away from them. The issue is not whether you're going to have them, it's what you're going to do with them. And right now I have a mountain staring me in the face and I've tried to logic it and I've tried to think it and I've tried to scheme my way about it and I've tried to figure it out. And you know what I've come to realize? That I can't. But as I came to this portion of Scripture recently, oh, my soul thrilled because it just reminded me all over again that I can't, but God can. That I can't move the mountain, but God moves mountains. In fact, on the day He saved me, let me tell you what He did. On that day, He moved a mountain of my sin out of the way. The story is told of Napoleon when he was in his, when he was in his advance. He was taking territories, and finally they came to a certain... A mountain range, maybe you've heard of it, called the Alps. And Napoleon wanted the nation that was on the other side of the Alps. And uh, somebody said to him, sir, we, we can't get there. We can't, we can't get to those people because of these mountains. These Alps are in our way. And they said little Napoleon stood up, put his hand in the air and said, then there will be no Alps. And they thought he was crazy. But Napoleon then got engineers, and to this day they... They made a mountain pass that literally cut the mountain in half, ran right through the middle of the Alps. It's an engineering marvel to the current day because one man said, we're not letting the mountain stop us. we got to get to the other side. May I tell you, when our Lord Jesus Christ went to Mount Calvary on that day, he took a mountain of sin and removed it and made a way so that sinners could come into the presence of a holy God. God specializes in moving the mountains. And how does he move them in our lives? Very simply, through prayer. Through prayer. Let me ask a question tonight before we go any further. Don't tell me what it is, just curious. How many of you have something right now that's weighing on you, staring you in the face, 
it's a decision, it's a difficulty, but something, you can't figure it out, you can't fix it, it's your mountain. Would you raise your hand big and high in the air? You have something, all right? How many of you have someone? <laughs> and maybe somebody needs to be saved, or somebody that's away from God, or somebody you're having a hard time with, somebody you're trying to help, but you have someone that is your mountain. Would you raise your hand, please? All right, so look, it may be something, or it may be someone, but on the authority of the Word of God tonight, I want to tell you, God is able to move that mountain if you and I will truly learn how to pray. And this is the lesson Jesus is teaching his disciples on the way to the cross. I'm going to give you three little thoughts tonight. They all come straight from the passage. I want you to mark them in your Bible. And they all start with the same letter so it will be really easy to remember. All right? If you want to learn to pray and see the mountains moved, you've got to have three things. First of all, come with me please down to verse number 25. When I stop, you say the next word. Verse 25. When you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught against any, that your Father. Would you circle that in your Bible in verse 25? And a second time in verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father. 189 times in the gospel records, God is referred to as Father. Maybe that doesn't mean much to you, but in the Old Testament Scripture, the great revelation of God was the revelation of God as creator, God as sustainer, God as judge. But it is only when our Lord Jesus steps onto the stage of human history that God really becomes known as Father. Oh, I love this. It took the Son to reveal the Father. If you want to know the Father, excuse me, you can't know the Father on your own. You can't get access to the Father on your own. If you want to know the Father, then you have to come through the Son. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so it's not till you get to the gospel records that we find God as our Father. Oh, but I revel in this. I rejoice in this. That me, a little nothing, had been brought into the family of God. And God now is my heavenly Father. I thank the Lord for my earthly dad. He called me today about something. It is talk briefly, just, just two or three minutes. But it meant something to me to hear from my earthly father today and the friendship and fellowship that we enjoy. Let me tell you something even better than that. I got a heavenly father who is with me every moment, everywhere I go. David said, when your father and your mother forsake you, then the Lord will take you up. When the dearest and nearest on earth let you down, and they will at times, even earthly fathers fail, the heavenly father never does. And if you really want to learn how to pray, then you must pray on the basis of him being your father. The whole idea is that we have a relationship with him. How many saved people are here tonight? Would you raise your hand? You actually know you're saved, all right? Did I tell you what happened when you got saved? Two things happened. Oh, I love this. How do you come into a family? In our world today, how do you come into a family? There's only two ways you can come into a family. What's one of them? You've got to be born, all right? That's very profound, very good. And what's the other way you can come into a family? You get adopted. That's exactly right. Watch this. The day you got saved, both of those things happened. See, there's a, there's a beauty to the adoption process because it means you are chosen. And there's a miracle to the birth process. And God uses both as an analogy for his salvation bringing you into his family because he wants you to know that it was the miraculous power of God that birthed you into the family. And it was the loving choice of God and his grace to you in adoption that gave you access to all of the Father's resources in Christ Jesus. We must go back to our relationship Look, please, you don't, you don't tiptoe into the Father's room. Not if you're a child, you don't. You come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. And I wonder sometimes why we pray such little measly prayers when our Father has bread enough and to spare. We perish with hunger. We live like a bunch of prodigals when the Father's servants have everything they need on the table. Listen to me. If you're a child of the Heavenly Father, then you have access to all of heaven's resources in Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, I love this expression in verse number 26. Your Father which is in heaven. God reminds us that He is higher and that He is greater. And it not only means relationship, it means fellowship. Ah, oh, therein lies perhaps our problem. Perhaps it is not that we are not saved. Perhaps it is that though we are saved, we're ashamed because there's something between us and the Father. See, it's really hard to pray with confidence when you know there's unconfessed, unforsaken sin in your life. Children avoid dad when they know things aren't, aren't right. Isn't that right? And may I say to you, until we get all the junk out of the Lord's way, 
we're never going to be able to pray like God intended for us to pray. You know what bothers me? It bothers me to think that I'm going to meet God someday at the judgment seat and he's going to say to me, Scott, look over here. See all this? These are all answers to prayer that I had ready to send. These are all answers I had ready to give and you never asked me. How many of you know God's answered some of your prayers? Would you raise your hand? You ever think about all the prayers that haven't been answered, not because he wouldn't answer, but because we never even asked? You know what Father does? Father takes us back to who God is. Remember, have faith in God. The word Father reminds me that I come with the Son. Who's speaking? Tell me, church, who's speaking in this passage? Who's talking to us? What's his name? Jesus is. Who is Jesus? He's the Son. He's the beloved Son. He's the only begotten Son. He's the one that can say, Abba, Father. Remember that in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is profound. You ready? The same Lord that called God Father made a way so we could call God our Father. Let that sink in just a minute. I want you to chew on that a second. As a matter of fact, after the resurrection, forgive me for jumping Resurrection Sunday for just a second, but after the resurrection, do you remember he bumped in to Mary in the garden and he said, don't touch me, don't touch me yet because I have not yet ascended to my God and your God, to my Father and, anybody know what he says next? Your Father. You ever think about what that means? That Jesus would say that the same Father that is his Father is our Father? What a privilege we have. What access, what authority, what assurance we have to call God our Father and to think that He would call hell-deserving sinners His children. Oh, blessed be the name of our great God. He's made a way so the mountains can be moved. When I say the name Father, it not only means that I come with the Son, it means I come through the Spirit. Romans chapter number 8. The Bible says that God puts His Holy Spirit inside of me. Galatians chapter 4 says the very same thing. And the Holy Spirit is the one who cries out, Abba, Father. Look, I couldn't call God my Father. I mean, why on earth would a sinner like me get to call God His Father unless the Holy Spirit had come to live inside of me and the Holy Spirit makes a way so that I can commune with the Creator God of the universe. I come with the Son. I come through the Spirit. And yes, I come to the Father and to all of His resources. May I ask you a question? What do you think it is that you can't ask God for? What's the thing too big for Him? What is the thing? Because Romans chapter 8 says, Do you really think that God who gave His own Son for you will not also freely give you all these other things? He is your Father. And if you want to see the mountains moved, you've got to start there. There's a second word I want you to see, and it's a great truth. Now look back at verse number 22. Jesus answering saith unto them, Have, what's that word? Faith in God. Now come down to verse 24 and mark the word believe and connect those two in your Bible. He says, have faith in God. And in verse 24, he says, believe that you receive them. So write down a second truth. If you want to see the mountain move, not only must there be a father, but secondly, there must be faith. Somebody said, well, isn't that the same thing as father? Oh, no, no, no. We're not talking about saving faith here. We're talking about praying faith and living faith. In fact, could I remind you who he's speaking to? He's speaking to his own disciples. They knew Jesus. They they knew God as their father. They had the relationship. They were in the fellowship. But what is he trying to do now? Please don't miss this. He's trying to strengthen their faith. He's trying to build their faith. I'm going to tell you what every believer in this room needs. I don't know. I don't care how long you've been saved, how many revival meetings you've attended, and how much Bible you know. There's not a single one of us whose faith is what it ought to be. And moments like these are moments where we ought to be praying, Dear Lord, strengthen my faith and help me to believe God for much more than I'm believing God for at this moment. I'll tell you what's really sad. Some of us who trust God to keep us out of hell won't trust God for the here and now. I mean, we'll actually believe God to take us to heaven someday and won't believe God to trust us or to help us with right what we're dealing with today. I want you to know, if you can believe God for your soul, you can believe God for today's situation. If you can believe God that you have never seen, you can believe God for what's staring you in the face today. And so notice what he teaches. Verse 22, he says, have faith in God. Notice it's in the present tense. How can we have faith when we're holding on to unbelief? Tell me, please. Have faith in God. And notice it's in the imperative. It's a command, which means there's a choice, which means you've got to decide whether you're going to exercise it or not. I'll tell you where every Christian is stuck. I'll tell you where every Christian is stuck. At the last place they refuse to believe God. 
I've been saved for 40 years, but that does not mean I have 40 years of progress in my faith. I meet people and I say to them, tell me about yourself. And they say, oh, preacher, I got 50 years of experience with the Lord. What they mean by that is they got saved 50 years ago. But when you start talking to them a little bit, you find out they actually have about 20 years of real experience with the Lord because they followed him in faith for about 20 years. And then somewhere along the line, they stopped following. They drew a line in the sand said, that's far enough. And at that moment, they stopped growing. And I tell you, it's time for some of God's disciples, some of Christ's followers to say, we're going to be people of faith in God again. I'm going to tell you why churches die. I'm going to tell you why they die. Not because they don't get good sermons. They die because of unbelief. They close all over this country, and I see it everywhere I go. And Christians shrivel up and die on the vine like that fig tree. May I tell you, God's giving us a very vivid picture here. You want to wither or you want to bear fruit? Look, you want to stop here or you want to go on for God? Because you've got to choose whether you're going to believe God or not. By the way, it's very interesting to me that he moves from the fig tree. They were shocked at the fig tree. He moves to a mountain, something much bigger. Watch this, please. You've got to believe God for big things. It was almost like the Lord said to Peter, you think that fig tree is a big thing? Look at that mountain over there. I can take care of that mountain. And I say to you, whatever the big thing is right now, it is an opportunity for you to believe God. I'm learning right now that the struggles and stresses and strains of life are invitations into the Father's throne room. They are opportunities to prove the faithfulness of our great God. Have faith in God. Look, don't you just believe God for big things. Believe that God is a big God and God is greater than whatever it is that you're dealing with right now. One of my favorite people to read after is a fellow by the name of Griffith Thomas. I like this. Griffith Thomas said, there's two expressions of faith. He said there's prayer and there's praise. I like this. He said prayer is faith that asks, but praise is faith that accepts. Sometimes we pray and beg, oh God, please help me. Oh God, please give this to me. Oh God, please break through in this. Did you ever think to turn it around and say, Lord, I can't see it yet. I don't know how it's going to happen. The mountain's still, still sitting right there in front of me. But I'm just going to stop right now and praise you that you are greater than that mountain. And I believe you're hearing and answering my prayer. And I'm trusting you're going to do the right thing. And I give you the glory and praise for it. You know, that is, that's a declaration of faith in God. That's a faith that accepts. I've experienced some of that recently in my own life. The circumstances have not yet changed, but my spirit has. Do you know what is going on? There's a great mountain moving going on in my heart. Look, we're not just talking about moving physical mountains. Dear Lord, may God move the mountains of doubt out of the way and the mountains of unbelief and the mountains of worldliness and the mountains of pride. Anything, everything that stands in God's way, God says, I'll move it if you will trust me. Could I remind you where they were standing when Jesus gave this lesson? little geography, time out. Do you know where they were standing? On a mountain. Would you like to guess what the mountain is? The Mount of Olives. You ought to read what Zechariah 14 says about the Mount of Olives. It says someday Jesus is going to come back. His feet are going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. And on that day, that mountain that they thought was immovable, it's been there for millennia, it's never moving. On that one moment when Jesus touches it, it's going to split in two and make a great valley. I love this. And I say to you, if Jesus can move that mountain, Jesus can move your mountain. I was reading today, an old preacher said this, and I love this. He said, God doesn't answer your prayer because of the, the arithmetic of your prayer. God doesn't care how long your prayer is. God doesn't answer your prayer because of the logic of your prayer. Do you really think you can out-reason God? God doesn't answer your prayer because of the eloquence of your prayer. He's not impressed by the beauty of it at all. He doesn't answer your prayer because of the rhetoric of your prayer or the music of your prayer. God doesn't answer your prayer because of the geometry of your prayer. He doesn't care how broad it is. God answers your prayer in the words of this old minister because of the divinity of your prayer. How much God is in it? Do we really think God answers our prayer because we pray long prayers or beautiful prayers or we pray oh, big prayers? Or do we believe that God answers prayers because God will get the glory through that prayer? Look, please. The form of prayer is no substitute for the substance of faith. When you pray, don't you just say a bunch of words and string together a bunch of religious cliches. When you pray, dear brother, dear sister, you have faith in God. And let it be the expression of a heart that is laying hold on the Lord and believing God for the much more. And God will delight to hear and answer that prayer. In fact, let me show you something. Look at, verse, look at verse number 24. He said, therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire. That's pretty broad. Whatever you desire. I've heard people preach this. Like anything you want, God will give it to you. 
How many of you have lived for the Lord long enough to know that's not true? Now, let me ask you a different question. How many of you have lived and prayed long enough to be glad that God didn't answer some of your prayers? Yes? So everything you desire is not in the will of God. First John says that we pray according to His will. James warns against asking amiss that we may consume it upon our lust. Let me tell you a little secret here. Spurgeon said the prayers God answers are the ones that begin with Him. You want to get some prayers answered? Find out what God wants and then pray that with confidence. Because look, when your desire lines up with His desire, you can be sure you're praying in the will of God. What things soever ye desire when you pray, look at it, believe that ye receive them. Two interesting words, believe and receive. By the way, isn't that how you got saved? You believed on the Lord, you received eternal life. How do you think you receive every good thing, every gift of grace? Look, you believe God and you receive what God has for you. Look, the prayers go up in faith and the answer comes down in God's power. Don't we serve an amazing God? How simple this is. Believe. You remember James 1 verse 5? If any of you lack wisdom, let me just stop and say that's me. Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. But he says this, but let him ask in what? Faith. Nothing wavering. For he that asketh when he's doubting and wavering, he says like a wave that's driven with the wind and tossed. And then he says this, let not that man think he'll receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It is not enough for you to simply ask. You must ask believingly and with confidence that God is fully able to hear and answer that prayer. In fact, hold on, Ephesians 3.20, God's able to exceeding abundantly above all you ask or even think. Amen. Believe. And then what of that word receive? This is prayer that, may I say this reverently, takes from God what God has for us to take. Years ago, in Knoxville, we had an old minister from Northern Ireland by the name of Ian Paisley. Ian Paisley came and preached. He preached some wonderful Bible messages. I remember that meeting and the Spirit of the Lord in it. But I'm going to tell you what struck me most about his visit was not his sermons. It was his prayers. In fact, I don't know that I've ever heard a preacher publicly pray like that man prayed. There was no show in it. They were not long prayers, but I remember the first time I ever heard him pray in public. He read his text and he said, shall we pray? I've never heard anybody pray so boldly. This is the way it began. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, I take the power of the Holy Spirit. I opened one eye to see if the Lord was standing there among us. I thought to myself, what kind of prayer is this? And every time I heard him pray, I take the Holy Spirit. It dawned on me. He was just doing what God had already offered to him. He wasn't demanding of God. He was just laying hold what God had already made available. Dear Lord, why do we live such weak, anemic, mediocre, substandard Christian lives when God offers to us all of his sufficiency if we will simply take it by faith? Believe and what? Receive. So what's the first word, church? You've marked it in your Bible twice in verse 25 and 26. You want to get your prayers answered, see the mountain move. Number one, the word is what? Father. The second word is what, church? Faith. So we begin with a relationship and then we learn to make our request with simple and definite faith in God. But there's one more word, and may I say, this may be one of the greatest mountains of all. Look at verse 25. And when you stand praying, what's the next word, please? Hmm. Help me now, Lord. Forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, that's a big if. There's a choice. Neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. But you write down that the mountain doesn't move unless you pray forgiving. I didn't say come asking for forgiveness. We do that. By the way, a little, little hint here. Did you know you don't have to ask God to do what God's already promised to do? God never says, beg me to forgive you. He says, confess your sin. Agree with what I said about it. Say the same thing about it I said. And the moment you agree with me, God says, that's good enough for me. You're forgiven and you're cleansed. 
But we pray for forgiveness for ourselves. But isn't it interesting? Jesus turns it around. And instead of dealing with the Godward view here, he deals with the manward life. Do you see how all the relationships connect to one another? And he says, if you want to be right with me, then you've got to be right with them. And if you want to get your prayers answered and have the full blessing, then you've got to get every barrier out of the way. People ask me frequently, Preacher, what do you think is one of the greatest hindrances to revival in our day? And I'm convinced one of them is unforgiveness. It's funny. Everybody wants you to come in and preach on all the worldly sins. That's right. Let me go off on some tangent and give some list of things you don't do, and everybody wants to shout, Amen, Preacher, give it to them. That's right. And then we start talking about sins of the Spirit that Jesus liked to talk about, and suddenly it gets woefully quiet. Because suddenly... Crawling through our hearts, isn't it? Cancer beneath the surface, unforgiveness. And Jesus says, if you won't forgive, you won't get your prayers answered. Let me speak to all the husbands and wives in here just a moment. Do you remember what Peter wrote? First Peter chapter 3, I think it is. He said that husbands and wives are, are heirs together of the grace of life. And he says, you better be careful to keep that relationship right and forgive one another and get over things and get past your past that your prayers be not hindered. Did I tell you that I think sometimes one of the greatest mountains we're facing is the mountain of bitterness? Did you know in churches sometimes there are people who won't speak to one another? And I find that hard to believe, but it's true. And what's true in church families is true in families. I was preaching a revival meeting a few years ago in a wonderful church, about an hour and a half from my home. I was driving back and forth every night. And on Wednesday night, Last night of the meeting, I came into the lobby of the church, and a little lady was standing out in the lobby. She had a brown paper sack. I can see her right now waiting on me. And everybody else was already in. They were starting to sing. And she said, oh, I'm so glad to see you. She said, I've been waiting on you. She said, I made you some banana nut bread today. And I said, praise God. It's going to be a good service tonight. That's wonderful. And then she said to me, I need to tell you something. And she started crying. And she said, you don't know me. She said, but I'm one of the faithful members of this church. She said, I've been here for decades. And she said, last night in the middle of the message, the Holy Spirit brought my sister to my mind. He, she said, I could see her face. She said, now you don't know this. She said, but my sister and I had a falling out 20 years ago. And she said, we have not spoken to one another for 20 years. And she said, I went home last night under such deep conviction. And she said, I tried to eat and couldn't eat. And she said, I tried to sleep and couldn't sleep. And she said, I tried to pray and couldn't pray. And she said, I tried to read my Bible and couldn't even read my Bible. And she said, finally, I thought, I can't live like this anymore. And she said, in the wee hours of the morning, I picked up the phone and called my sister. And she started laughing through her tears. She said, preacher, would you know that God had been working on her too? And she said, over the phone this morning, she said, we got right with God and we got right with each other. And I, I can see her. She threw both hands in there. She said, and it's just been the most wonderful day all day today. You know what that is? That's revival. That's mountains getting moved. That's the power of God at work in hearts. The hardest thing for God to move is us. Matter of fact, do you remember what Jesus taught early on in Matthew chapter number 6 when he taught that first lesson of the Sermon on the Mount? Now, we're all at the end. We're at the Olivet Discourse now. Back up to the Sermon on the Mount. We're just saying Matthew chapter 6. And he taught them how to pray. Do you remember? And how did it begin? Our what? Father, same, same principle as here. You've got to start with the Father. But when he got to the end of that model prayer, do you remember? He had taught them to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Then Jesus circled back and gave two more verses on the subject of forgiveness because he said, if you're not willing to forgive, don't expect to get this prayer answered. It's powerful. And I want to ask you, how on earth do you think we can get answers from God when we're still holding on to bitterness from the past? Pray tell me. How we can harbor ill feeling against others in our hearts and expect the love of God to be manifest abroad in our hearts and in our communities. I say to you, the mountain has to be moved. If you want to see the power of God, we must seek the Lord right now while he may be found and say to God, God, get all the mountains moved and make a way where we cannot make a way for ourselves. A friend sent me a verse today. He did not know what I was preaching on tonight. When he sent me the verse, I looked it up. <laughs> I started laughing. Isn't it just like the Lord to send you what you need just when you need it? What a great God we serve. Amen. May I show you the verse as I conclude tonight? It's, it's not here. It's not in this passage of Scripture. But 
Just take a guess where it is. It's back in the book of Zechariah. Doesn't it seem like Zechariah has been coming out a lot this week? All day yesterday we referenced Zechariah. Already tonight we've referenced Zechariah. And here's the verse he sent me. Look at Zechariah chapter 4. Now we, we like to quote verse number 6. Not by might nor by power, by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. That's a great verse. Huh. Look at Zechariah chapter 4, verse number 7. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying grace, grace unto it. Doesn't that sound a lot like speak to this mountain and it'll be removed and cast into the sea? Do you know what the context is? They're coming back to Jerusalem to the rubble and to the rubbish and to the ruins of the temple and the city. Oh, I love this. They're probably looking at a mound of debris and God says, you see that big mountain of debris? You see that big mountain there? That's all going to be cleaned up and I'm going to make a nice even plane out of it. Lord, how are you going to do it? Look at, the, look at the word that's repeated twice at the end of the verse. Grace, grace unto it. I'm going to tell you tonight, friends, we need a fresh dose of the grace of God right now. Because only the grace of God can move the mountains. But if some of God's Zerubbabels will start believing Him again, and praying in faith again, and pick up that prayer list again, and go after that soul again that you gave up on years ago, and start trusting God for the thing that you think is way out of your reach, but it's never out of God's reach, if some of us will start to do that again, you know what I think we'll see? I think we'll see God move some mountains. But it begins this way. Have faith in God. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit, and don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.